The Battle of Guilford Courthouse was fought on March 15, 1781 in what is now Greensboro, North Carolina. The British were commanded by Lord Charles Cornwallis and the Americans were commanded by General Nathaniel Green. The troop numbers are on screen now as well as the casualties, but note that over a thousand of the American casualties are due to militia deserting after the battle and during the battle. The Americans really only suffered about 246 casualties during the battle, and such heavy British losses resulted in a strategic victory for the Americans. Before the battle, the British had a great success in conquering much of Georgia, South Carolina, and most of North Carolina with the aid of strong loyalist factions, and they thought that North Carolina might be within their grasp. In fact, the British were in the process of heavy recruitment in North Carolina when this battle put an end to their recruiting drive. In the wake of the battle, Green moved into South Carolina, while Cornwallis chose to march into Virginia to link up with roughly 3,500 men under British Major General Phillips and Benedict Arnold. These decisions allowed Green to unravel British control of the South while leading Cornwallis to Yorktown and eventual surrender to General George Washington. On January 17, 1781, American General Daniel Morgan, the British Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton at the Battle of Cowpens, which was a severe blow to Cornwallis' light infantry companies, supplies, and his cavalry. Cowpens was a surprising victory and a turning point in the war, and it was seen as a battle that stirred up the people, not only those of the backcountry Carolinas, but those in all southern states. As it was, the Americans were encouraged to fight further, and the Loyalists and British were demoralized. Furthermore, its strategic result, which was the destruction of an important part of the British Army in the South, was crucial toward ending the war. Along with the British defeat at the Battle of Kings Mountain, Cowpens was a serious blow to Cornwallis, who might have defeated much of the remaining resistance in South Carolina had Tarleton won at Cowpens. Instead, the battle set in motion a series of events. Cornwallis abandoned his post efforts in South Carolina, stripped his army of his excess baggage, including a lot of his personal belongings, and pursued Greene's force into North Carolina. Skirmishes occurred at the Catawba River on February 1st, 1781, and other fords. Yet, after a long chase, Cornwallis met Greene at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse on March 15, 1781, while encamped in the forks of the Deep River. Cornwallis was informed that Greene was encamped at Guilford Courthouse. With him was a body of North Carolina militia, plus reinforcements from Virginia consisting of about 3,000 Virginia militia, Virginia State Regiment, a corps of Virginian 18th month men who were just about done with their enlistment, and people from the Maryland line, totaling between 4,000 and about 5,000 men. Cornwallis decided to give battle, though he only had about 1,900 men at his disposal. He detached his baggage train, 100 infantry, and 20 cavalry under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton to Bell's Mills further down the deep river. Before breakfast could be eaten, Cornwallis set off with his main force, arriving at Guilford Courthouse at midday. The advance guard of both armies met near the Quaker New Garden Meeting House. Dragoons from Bannister Tarleton's British Legion were briefly engaged by Light Horse Harry Lee's dragoons about four miles from Guilford Courthouse. The British 23rd Regiment of Foot sent reinforcements forward and Lee withdrew, ordering a retreat to Nathaniel Green's main body. After this brief engagement, both sides lined up for battle. The American Army was formed into three lines. The first line comprised the North Carolina Militia under Generals John Butler and Thomas Eaton. 400 yards behind them was the second line, which was made up of two brigades of Virginia Militia under Generals Edward Stevens and Robert Lawson. The last line held the Continental Regulars, mostly from Virginia and Maryland. These Regulars were joined by riflemen, light infantry, and dragoons on the flanks. Green deployed his three lines on the face of a hill, each roughly three to 400 yards apart. The battle began with a 20-minute artillery barrage from American six-pounders against the forming British troops. The British artillery answered with three six-pounders, though losses on both sides were bare minimal. The British advanced towards Green's first line in two, which became three columns. 
They were compro- composed of both British, Loyalist, and Hessian formations. And when the British came within 140 yards of the North Carolina infantry, the Americans opened fire from behind a rail fence. However, a few militiamen got off more than two shots and most simply threw down their guns and ran. Those that did fire rarely hit their mark at the extended range. Green reported to Samuel Huntington, We did all we could to induce the men to stand their ground, but neither the advantage of the, of the position nor any other consideration could induce them to stay. As the British advanced, the Virginians in the second line delivered several effective volleys upon the enemy. Their success was short-lived, and the second line fell back before the weight of Cornwallis' army, and numerous units regrouped with Continental regulars on the third line and in the flanks. As the British approached the third line, their ranks were noticeably depleted. The first two lines of militia and the regular actions on both flanks had inflicted numerous casualties as well as diverted large detachments of British troops. Separate fights took place on the flanks and units were drawn away from the center. The British left pushed against the main American line and were sharply repulsed. However, in the center, Cornwallis' troops fought the Americans in a fierce hand-to-hand melee. Counterattacks by American cavalry and Continentals were unable to break the determined British, whose artillery fire and a charge by the British Legion helped force the Americans back. The third line contained one brigade of regulars from Virginia and another brigade from Maryland. The British 2nd Battalion of Guards turned the American left flank as the 2nd Maryland Regiment prematurely broke due to poor training and confusing orders. The guards were vigorously counterattacked by American Dragoons under Lt. Col. William Washington, but Cornwallis' army prevented the destruction of his guards when they fired grape shot into the melee. The British guns killed many of their own men, but the counterattack was checked. Soon after, the remaining regiments of the 3rd line began a general retreat north, abandoning their artillery as they marched. The battle lasted only 19 minutes. The British were outnumbered more than 2 to 1, yet defeated the American force. In doing so, however, they lost over a quarter of their men. After the battle, the British were spread across a large expanse of woodland without food and shelter, and during the night, torrential rains started. Fifty of the wounded died before sunrise, and had the British followed the retreating Americans, they might have come across their baggage and supply wagons, which had been left where the Americans had camped on the west of the Salisbury Road prior to the battle, but they didn't. On March 17th, two days after the battle, Cornwallis reported his casualties as 3 officers and 88 of other ranks killed and 24 officers and 384 of other ranks wounded, with a further 25 men missing in action. Webster was wounded during the battle and died two weeks later. Lt. Col. Bannister Tarleton, commander of the British Legion, was another officer who was wounded when he lost two fingers after taking a bullet in his right hand. To avoid another Camden, Green retreated with his forces intact. With his small army less than 2,000 strong, Cornwallis declined to follow Green into the backcountry, retiring to Hillsborough. He raised the royal standard, offered protection to the inhabitants, and for the moment appeared to be master of Georgia and the two Carolinas. In a few weeks, however, he abandoned the heart of the state and marched to the coast at Wilmington, North Carolina to recruit and refit his command. 
General Greene boldly pushed down towards Canvin in Charleston, South Carolina, with a view to drawing his antagonist after him to the points where he was the year before, as well as to driving back Lord Rawdon, who Cornwallis had left in the field. In his main object, the recovery of the southern states, Greene succeeded by the close of the year, but not without hard fighting and repeated reverses. The battle was key in leading up to Yorktown, where the British would eventually surrender to American forces and French forces.